Tonight we're going to be talking about the currency of time, something I was hearing about millennials the other day and about how millennials, which technically I am and a couple other people here are included in that, uh, we are valuing time more than money. And they said it almost as like a slight uh, towards our generation, which I thought it was more of a compliment. I think we're figuring it out more than not figuring it out when we think about that. We value the time that we spend at work. We know how important it is to spend time with our families and everything else. I was watching a thing, too, about salary cap, the NFL salary cap, and, of course, Le'Veon Bell and everything he's dealing with right now and trying to get his money and the Steelers trying to negotiate things and trying to stay within the salary cap. So those of you who don't know, the NFL has a salary cap. So say you have 100%, you have 100% of money, you can only give 100% of that money. You can't go over it. That's just the way it is. So they have to try to fit all these players, these 53-man roster and their salaries into that salary cap. So it's a very difficult thing to do. It's the same thing with your time. You have 24 hours in a day, not one second more, not one second less. You have 24 hours in a day. You divvy that pie up in that 24 hours, however you deem you want to do. And guess what? You can't get any of it back, and you can't take any of it and advance it forward or anything else. It is more valuable than money, which is something we'll talk about here in a little bit. But your pre-study question has to deal with that. It says, which do you think is more important, time or money? Just because I said it up here that I think time is more valuable than money, I might be wrong. Why do you think that? Have you ever seen the play, just looking at our study there, Thornton Wilder's Our Town. It's a classic play. I, I ended up watching a production of it when I was a teacher uh, with some of my students. We went up to watch it in Pittsburgh, and it was a professional production. Uh, very well done, of course. Uh, the play is basically pantomime. There's not a lot of set pieces. They don't want to do set pieces because they're trying to get you to pay attention to the characters. The characters are important. And if you'll bear with me a little bit, I want to go uh, have an overview of this play just a little bit to give you a little bit of what, what's happening with it. Uh, I think it will be a valuable thing for our lesson. So our town, the play is centered on a, a little town called Grover's Corners. If you never watch it, it's in New Hampshire, supposedly. 1901 is when it takes place. Small, sleepy little town, very much like Wellsburg or Fallensby or anything like that. Through Act 1 of the play, there's three acts. There's, uh, through Act 1 of the play, we're introduced to several characters. Just typical people, you know, like Howie Newsome. He's the milkman, you know. He's m making the deliveries every day as the milkman used to do. You have uh, there, you have... Um, Joe Crowl Jr., he's a paper boy, doing the same thing, making his rounds. We meet in Act 1, Dr. Gibbs, who's returning. He's a doctor, of course. He's delivering twins. What a joyous day this happens to be. Then we meet Mrs. Webb, and we're in her house, and we're in her house for all of Act 1. And she's busy making breakfast for her kids, you know, and her husband. Typical things back then, before the kids go off to, work, or to school and, and uh, the husband goes off to work. And then you meet the neighbor boy, George Gibbs, and uh, Emily Webb is uh, the daughter of the Webbs. And then you meet George Gibbs, who lives across the way, just next door. And, and, and they make no secret about their uh, uh, liking each other. They, they seem, seem to like each other. Flirtation uh, is almost instantaneous. You know, just typical things, typical day, typical life. You know, progressing second by second, minute by minute, hour by hour. Nothing different. Think of it as if you've ever been on a subway or a train. It's almost the same thing. You're, you're standing stationary. You're stationary, but everything seems to be moving very quickly around you. We just get a little moment in time. Second act takes place. Three years, three years in the future. Boom. So you're in act one, just typical day, three years in the future. It's George and Emily's wedding day. Oh, my. Lots has changed in three years. Pretty crazy, huh? It's George and Emily's wedding day. We learn another story. They have a little flashback. How did they, how did they get to this point? Well, they were talking about that. They go back in time, and, and there's George and Emily walking home, and George has just been elected uh, the president uh, of the class, and, and she was elected the secretary and the treasurer. And George had also become kind of a local baseball legend. He's kind of pretty good at baseball. And uh, she said he's kind of full of himself, which he kind of took offense to, but he appreciated her honesty. They end up going over to Mr. Morgan's drugstore for ice cream, and they basically hit it off and say they're going to start dating. So three years in the future, they're getting married. Of course, all the nerves and everything else. And at the end of Act Two, we see, you know, 
probably not too different from what you, how you met your spouse. They have, you have the story, and then at end act two, we see them. They're married, and they, they run off into the crowd uh, happily ever after, right? A beautiful wedding day, beautiful couple, their whole life ahead of them. Act three hits, the last act. Nine years in the future, jumped again. Emily is now dead. She passed away during childbirth, something that was not expected. Act three takes place at the graveyard. It's a cemetery on a hilltop overlooking Little Grover's Corners, New Hampshire. Emily joins the dead souls who will fill up the, the room. Most of them we met throughout the play. Different people we've met throughout the play, different people of Grover's Corners. They become indifferent to the earthly events, but Emily still, she, she disapproves of that. She still, there's still something about her. She wants to see the past. So she goes back to a certain day in her time, just a normal day, her 12th birthday. For some reason, that was the moment she wanted to go back to. And she's kind of like that omniscient character just walking around, of viewing her 12th birthday. It's quite the typical day. Howie Newsom and Joe Crowell Jr. delivering the milk and the paper. Mrs. Webb giving her daughter some presents, calling Mr. Webb down. As Emily participates, she also watches the scene as an observer. She knows her parents' youth and beauty. Emily now has a nostalgic appreciation for everyday life that her parents and the other living characters do not share. She has that omniscient view. She sees what she should have appreciated about that day, looking back. Hindsight's 2020. She becomes agonized by the beauty and shortness of everyday life and demands to be taken back to the cemetery. As Emily transports back to the cemetery and settles in with the other dead souls, there's George, her husband laying face down on the ground at her gravestone, weeping, crying. And I'll never forget, watching that play, two very powerful lines stuck out to me. She said, they don't understand, she said of the living people. And she said, does anyone ever realize life while they live it? Every, every minute. And that's the end of the play, basically. The stars come out in Grover's Corner, and that's it. The play ends. And so is life. Life, death, birth. God's Word advises us to use time wisely because He knows that there are many things in life that can distract us from what truly matters. Do not waste your time so you look back with regret. You do not know what tomorrow holds. So that's what we're talking about tonight. Does anybody truly appreciate every single moment of every single day? And how do we appreciate them a little bit more? Time is fleeting. We hear those from the pulpit all the time. Oh, you know, and you hear scare tactics, I think, a lot of times. You know, some, you know there's stories of people who drove out of church and they died immediately after that, which happens sometimes. It's scare tactics, sometimes just true stories. It's life. I'm not here to scare you today. I'm here to tell you the truth. And if you're scared by it, then you need to make your soul right. Can we appreciate every moment of every day? That's our first question there. Sadly, it is hard to appreciate every single moment of every single day. Let's look at the story of the rich man and Lazarus. This will be our longest reading, but it is definitely uh, crucial. And I, I think, you know, we've probably heard most of it before in our lives, but still bear with me and, and follow along if you can. Luke 16, 19-31. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. Notice that? The rich man and the poor man die. There's no respecter of persons. Doesn't matter how rich you are, doesn't matter how powerful you are on this earth, you will die. And doesn't matter how lowly you are, how pathetic your life seems, you will die as well. 
In Hades, there, was un- to- there he was in torment. He looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called up to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me. And send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am agony in this fire. Did he say anything about, Father Abraham, can you bring me some of my possessions that I had on this earth? I had a nice house. I was dressed. Can you bring me any of that, those things? Can you bring me a nice meal down here? Everything that he had on this earth was down to one tip of water. That's all he wanted. He would have traded everything that he had on this earth, every moment he had on this earth, for a tip of a finger in a drop of water. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, while Lazarus received bad things. Now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you is a great chasm, and has been set in place. So that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, then they will repent. He said to them, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. Very sad story. You know, we hear it many times as a child growing up all the way, and sometimes I think it's one of those things just like life. We get desensitized to it. One of the only instances we have in the Bible where we see the afterlife, a little peek into what it will be like. Still, we kind of ignore it, I think. Lazarus was not a humble man, or not Lazarus, the rich man was not a humble man. He was not a good man from what we've read in the scripture. He did not treat Lazarus well, and it did not seem like he treated very many people well. But his heart was not a bad person. You know, you have ever heard two-dimensional characters a lot of times in stories. They're just bad people. They're just, why are they bad? They're just bad to be bad. Then you have three-dimensional characters in stories, which are, they have, they're bad, but they have a heart for something else. They're not all bad. They're real humans. That's humans. We're three-dimensional people. We don't, we're not all bad. No one's all bad. Even Hitler wasn't all bad. Oh, gasp. How did I dare I say that? But it's true. He wasn't. Hitler had a mother. He had a father. He lived this life. He grew up. I'm sure he had crushes. I'm sure he had failures and successes. I'm sure he had teachers who dearly loved him and people who very much cared about him. But he was a bad man overall, just like the rich man. He did not use his time wisely. But that does not mean it is impossible. Let's look at Ecclesiastes 5, 18 through 20. This is what I have observed to be good, that is appropriate for a person to eat, to drink, and to find satisfaction in their toilsome labor under the sun during the few days of life God has given them, for this is their lot. What does Solomon say there? How many days do we have? A few days. Solomon is the wisest man that ever lived other than Jesus. And he says we have a few days. Did Solomon live just a few days? No, he lived many years. But he says we only have a few days. Moreover, when God gives someone wealth and possessions and the ability to enjoy them, to accept their lot and be happy in their toil. If he does give you wealth, just as the rich man had it, don't sit there and gloat about it. Don't lord it over people. Don't act like you're so much more important than people. Be happy that he gave it to you and do good with it. This is a gift from God. They seldom reflect on days of their life because God keeps them occupied with gladness of heart. A lot of times I think the same thing with Satan. We use this tactic to distract us from what we really, our true goal is. He uses babies. You hear Callie crying, you know, everybody's eyes went, what is going on over there? I'm not saying I'm the most important person in the world, but we all do it. I read a book one time about that, how Satan uses even babies in the audience to distract you. And I'm not saying Callie's like Satan, of course, and anything like that. You know, but I don't know. It's an interesting thing to think about, how we are trying distracted, distracted. Our mind is moving forward. We're trying to follow along with something. We might be learning something, and Satan goes, I hate that. I don't want you to learn that. Pay attention to me. Your phone's going off. 
Oh, your phone's going off. Oh, there's a text message. Check the text message. Things like that. It's just so strange how, like, when you were just right in a moment of, you know, oh, I, I think I've figured this out, that you're, what? What do I have to do? Oh, I have to go do this. You can't tell me that Satan doesn't use those things. How do we spend our time? There was a movie that was, it came out in 2006. I remember watching it. It, it, it got terrible reviews. And so I kind of just bought the DVD. I remember probably like 2008, and I was like, I'm just going to watch this. It's one of those nights where you just had nothing else to do, like Friday night, I just want to watch it. So it was called, called Click. It had Adam Sandler in it. And I thought it was going to be awful. I was just going to say, this is going to be awful, but whatever. Maybe it has some funny parts. So the whole premise was this guy goes into Bed Bath & Beyond, and uh, he, he uh, was trying to find something, Bed Bath, uh, remote control, I think, for his TV. He gets his seat like special remote control that controls time and everything else. Like you can go forward in time, you can go backwards in time, you can pause time, you can do whatever you want. So of course, you know, I'm saying there's making all these kind of jokes with it. But it has some very serious good meanings in it. And to talk about how we spend our time and some of the things that he does with that uh, is very interesting. And we'll bring that up a little bit later, but just keep that in mind. But one of the things he does is he focuses too much on his earthly future plans. He's always so focused on everything else. Oh, it's distracting. Oh, I got to go get this controller. I got to do this. I got to do this for work. I got to do all these kind of things. I got to get a promotion. I want a better vacation. A guy asked me one time, said, when does it stop? We get a boat, we want a bigger boat. We get a house, we want a better house. We get a car, we want a better car. When do you, are you content? And we as people are never content, it seems like. Promotions, vacations, collecting more things. That's another thing someone told me one time. I just talked to a lady in Columbus, and she said uh, she never heard of the Church of Christ when she was over here in America. Her and her husband became Christians when they were in the Philippines. He was stationed over there. They heard of the Church of Christ in the Philippines, of all things. And so they came back here, and they became members of the Church of Christ. He was a preacher down in, uh, down in Middleburn for a long time. I, don't know, I forgot his name now, but you guys, Lonnie, might know him or somebody down there. But... Um, very interesting to think about that. But she said, you know, our, us Americans and our things, we're always so wrapped up in our things. And I said, that's pretty true. Let's look at Matthew 6 and 33 and see what it says about that. But seek ye first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. It doesn't say seek a promotion. It doesn't say seek a vacation to Malibu or wherever people go. Uh, that's, that's a nice vacation. It doesn't say, you know, and that's one thing about Instagram and stuff they say now. We're all competing with each other to say who goes to the cooler place. What we're doing is, is more interesting than other people. Uh, that shouldn't be what it is. We should be seeking God and his kingdom. That should be the first thing we do. Let's look at Colossians 3 and 2. It says, set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. Don't focus on these stupid things. More money, more things. You know, that's one thing Shannon and I talk about quite often. We have, a, we have a, a house now. We have a little dog that's about this big. If you haven't seen her, she's super small. And uh, ornery is all get out. And we have you know, two cars. What, what else do we need? You know, you get to a spot where we're talking about Christmas, and it's like, you don't need anything for Christmas. You know, like, we don't need more. We don't need 52 rooms in a house. You know, be content with what you have. Be thankful for what you have. God has blessed us very much. We have really no control over these things, these promotions, these things we're working so hard for. You see stories all the time where people work so hard for promotion, and they get what? Bypassed. Well, they get passed over. And it's the end of the world. People committed suicide over stupid things like that. What happened when the stock market crashed in the 30s or whatever? People jumped off buildings and everything else. Where was their intentions at? It wasn't with God. Let's look at Proverbs 19.21. It says, Many are the plans in a person's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. It's not our purpose. It's God's purpose that's going to prevail. People focus on that future too much. Don't focus on the future. And people also live in the past. You ever seen someone like that? I have a friend like that. Always talks about the good old days at Brook. Oh, remember we were at Brook and we did high school. I mean, you remember high school? You had acne and you were going through puberty and like it was awkward. You smelled weird all the time. Like I was like, high school was not that great of a time, man. Like you were strange looking. You were gangly, you know. I mean, maybe you guys were way better looking than I was in high school, but it was like it was not the, the greatest time. You had to deal with a lot of stupid stuff, you know, not figuring out who you are and all these kind of things like that. Oh, remember the good old days, the good old days. And I'm sure you guys have people in your life that remember that. What's Isaiah 43, 18 said, says? It says, forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. God says don't dwell on the past. The past is in the past. 
Evidently, Dad is not very fond of his childhood because he says the best thing about the past is it's in the past. And it's true, it, it, uh, to a certain extent. It's all right to reflect on those things and say, oh, you know, that was a good time. You see a picture come up on Facebook memories or something like that. Oh, that was a nice time. But to sit there and live in the past and say, you know, I heard someone say the other day, if, you know, what if you, I'd been just five minutes later? What if I'd been five minutes sooner? You can lose yourself in that. There's a song I remember that said the guy had too much to think, not drink, too much to think. You ever met someone like that? All they do is think, 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 and never do anything? That's not a good way to live. If I had just been five minutes sooner, if, if my whole life would have been different. If I had been five minutes later, my whole life would have been different. The devil uses this to get us looped in these things of unsatisfaction. We look at our lives and we're unsatisfied with the present because we're so worried about the past. If only when I was 20, if I had done that, if I was 25 and I had to, you didn't. This is where you're at now. This is where your life is. Bill Keene, this is attributed to him. I don't know if you remember Family Circus. I think it's still out in the comp, funny pages if anybody gets the newspaper still. But he says, yesterday is history, tomorrow is a mystery, today is a gift, that's why it's called the present. And you've probably heard some variation of that quote by different people. But it's an interesting part, the last of it. Today is a gift, that's why it's called the present. But what do we look at the present as? Oh, today is Monday. I hate Monday. I have to go to work at a job, and I have to do work to get money. I think a preacher not too long ago had a, a, an al analogy to uh, this woman, I think it was in our gospel meeting even maybe, where the guy was saying, you know, he, uh, the woman was saying, I have all this, this terrible job. And he said, okay, what do you think was terrible about your job? She made a list of three things. And he said, okay, what do you like about your job? Well, I like nothing. Well, think about it. You like the paycheck? You like this? So I, I, before too long, she had a list of 100 things, balancing out the three things. It's all in perspective, folks. If we're worried about the past, we're worried about the future, we're not worried about the present, the present is where we need to be at. Flip on the back there. Is this moment in your life beautiful? I think that's an interesting thing. So sometimes we look at this moment in our life and say, oh, you know, I'm in church on a Sunday night. Oh, golly. Why, why is it such a bad thing, you know? Oh, I, I wish I could be doing this. I wish I was somewhere else. I, you know, it's getting to be winter out, and especially in this, we know that, when it gets cold out and snow and it's January. Other than my birthday, I like my birthday. But other than that, it, it, it's like I want to be somewhere else. What is it? The, I want to be in a tropical island. What's everybody always say to I want to be on a beach. You know, if, my father-in-law always says, if I, ever if, if I ever win the lottery, I'm going to give these people $100,000. If I ever win the lottery, he said the other, yesterday we were at the WVU game, if I win the lottery, those people always give people free parking. I'm going to give them $100,000 to pay their parking lot. And I said, John, I said, if you win the lottery, you're not going to have any money because you've already gave it out to everybody. You know. Why is this moment in your life beautiful? Is it? Yeah, it is. Take joy in this moment in your life. Don't be so, so angry about it. Let's look at Ecclesiastes 3, 11 through 13. He has made everything beautiful in his time. He has also set eternity in human hearts. Yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. I know that there is nothing better for people than to be happy and to do good while they live, that each of them may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all their toil. This is the gift of God. Solomon says this is the gift of God, to eat and drink and be happy. Be happy. So many Christians, so many people walk around, and Christians, like I said, you see Christians who are like, you had, there's a kid in, in college. You ever seen a human Eeyore? You know what I'm talking about. You ever watch Winnie the Pooh? Eeyore, oh, everything's terrible. Hi, Pooh. Oh, it's the worst day of my life. There was a guy in our school named Matt, and he was the human Eeyore. If you got stopped talking to Matt, your life was going to be miserable for the next six hours because he did not even put a period in his sentence where you go, i got to go. You couldn't stop. Every day. And you know, I learned more about his algebra class and his math tutors and how horrible his girlfriend is and how horrible this part of his life is. And it never, ever stopped. And you just get to a spot where you say, you need to do something about this. If you are this miserable about life, let's make a change in it. Don't be that human Eeyore. Take joy in your life. 
And the last point we have here is invest your currency of time wisely. I think there's, someone said there's like 500,000 seconds or whatever in a day. And then someone said if they gave you 500,000, I don't know, that's not the right number probably, but if they gave you this much money and so you lost $10, $10 of that, would you be angry about those $10? The answer is no, because you, you had 490 some thousands. You're like, whatever, I lost $10, who cares? It's the same thing with life. If someone you're driving and you always hear people, oh, I had this person did this and this person did this and I had this happen in the morning and, and everything is just, the whole day is going to be horrible because of this. I hate it when people say the whole day is going to be horrible. That is not a good attitude to have. You stop that. You put a, a, a kibosh to that. You say, okay, the morning was not so great, but guess what? The rest of the day is going to be good. And there's sometimes when the day just seems out to get you. It seems like a horrible, rotten, no good, very bad day, and it's out to get you, and there's nothing you can do to stop it. It was like the one day I was coming home to pick up my dad to take him to uh, my mother and father-in-law's to eat. And so I got hit by uh, shrapnel from a tractor trailer. And it, I totaled my car, so or whatever, I had to go out and get it, it fixed. For, it took like a month and a half to get it fixed. And I was just like, if I just didn't go to pick up Dax, he didn't even want to go anyhow. He's like, oh, I don't want to go. So he didn't go, of course. I'm just going to sit here. So I, dri I was driving the other way to pick him up, and then he didn't want to go, so I had to take my car. I'm like, this day is just horrible, no matter what I did. But you sit there, and I told Shannon, I said, let's just hit the reset button. Let's just go to bed. Obviously, we need to just go to bed and wake up and try to start again. And I'm not saying that I have the best attitude in the world because I'm, I'm preaching this lesson for myself. But you do sometimes just hit the reset button and say, tomorrow's a new day. I love Chicken Little, the cartoon, if you've ever seen it, you know, the sky is falling, the sky is falling, and everybody makes fun of him, and he says, you know what? He says, today's a new day, today's a new day. Whatever. It's not that big a deal. So here's some ways to invest in your currency wisely. Let's look at uh, Psalms real quick here. 1912. It says, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. So it, the Bible talks about this, using your days wisely. You only have so many days. One thing I don't have there is be humble. What is humble? You hear people say it all the time. And as a kid, I never understood it. When I was Lydia's age and I was even in high school and I was in my 20s, I didn't understand humility. And I still kind of have a tough time understanding it. I met some people that I, I try to emulate in humility, see how they do. But what is it? It is just basically lower yourself in importance. You are not the most important thing in the world, so don't think that you are the most important thing in the world. That will help you a lot. So be humble. What's that song? It's a country song. I think it says, always be humble and kind. That's a good thing to keep in your mind at all times. And there's another quote that says, there are those who are humble and there are those who are about to be. If you're living life arrogantly, you will be humbled. Look at the rich man. What happened to him? when He was humbled in death, sadly. We don't want to be this kind of people. We want to humble ourselves on earth so we don't have to be humbled in death. Let's look at Luke 14, 11 real quick. Luke 14, 11, it says, For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. So humble yourself. That's one way to keep your time wisely. Realize you are not the most important thing in the world, and that is a good thing. Here's another one. I, I have a hard time believing this, but it, it, I've seen it a lot. I don't know, I'll even point out my own family. My own family has a very, very difficult time saying this. Say you're sorry. Why is it so hard to say, I'm sorry? It is so difficult for people. I don't know why. Over-apologize. Who cares? It doesn't matter. Ken's very good at over-apology. I don't know why he is, but he always is like going over and above trying to apologize. I'm like, he's like standing in the back and you don't, just, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Like, and you know, dude, just, I just wanted to open the door. But it, just who cares? Like, why do you not say I'm sorry? And then uh, I, like, I like this Benjamin Franklin quote, never ruin an apology with an excuse. That's so true. We, we go, I'm sorry, but, I'm sorry, but, I we try to make an excuse for it. Just say, I'm sorry, and move on. Those are very tough words to come out of our mouth, and you know why? There's one reason for it. It's the devil. So when you think about those things, think about that. Going back to the movie Click, like I said, he, had this, he has this controller, right? goes forward and backwards and all this stuff. 
he's annoyed with his kids. You know, he, he starts out the movie, and, and there's a uh, tree house up there. And, it, and he said, we are, we're going to finish that tree house. It said, start of the tree house. We're going to finish that tree house. Oh, yeah, Dad, we're going to finish it. Yeah, we're going to finish it, kids. And it's not paying attention to him. They're watching Dragon Tales, the cartoon. Oh, I'm, just not, I'm trying to watch this. I want to do this. His wife's trying to talk to him. Oh, I got work to do. I got the, the things to do. Get out of the, of the house as fast as possible and go on. At the halfway through the movie, towards the end, his wife, in one scenario, it's called the bad, bad day or whatever, his wife is laughing for another man. She's married to another person. He's got robustly fat. He's like, I'm fat. What happened to me? His kid, his son, is really, really fat. And he's like, what happened to you? His daughter is dressing inappropriately. He's very upset with this, and this is in the future. And so he's out there just like, what is going on with my life? And the guy who's kind of giving this magic control, he says, you know, every time you had a conflict at work or home, you chose work. And I think that's an interesting thing for us to think about. What do we choose when we have a conflict at home? What do we choose when, when we need to say we're sorry? Do we choose work? Do we choose something that's not of God? Or do we choose what is of God? Let's look at James 5.16. It says, James 5.16 it says, Therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. <coughs> Pray for each other. Work with each other. Don't be ashamed of sins. There's no sin that no, the people have not done. There's nothing new under the sun. Confess your sins. Say you're sorry. It's okay. Spend real time with people. Today, it's very easy to do what? Take our phones, look at it, and they kind of half pay attention. Oh, yeah, well, I'll get right. I just got to text this person. Uh, yeah, I, I'm having 400 conversations at once. I, I, my phone now, if you ever see it, has an airplane mode on it every time I come into church. Because it used to be when I was younger that my phone would go off. And I have this bad habit of if my phone vibrates, I immediately want to see what it is. Just in case, just in case it's an emergency. I don't want to see what it is. There's no emergency. What happened before phones? We all were alive except for like the little ones. Before the phones. And what happened if there was an emergency? We found out about it afterwards. Can you do anything about it? Poor Ed's lost his house. He couldn't do anything about it. Like, he'll tell you the first one. He lost it during church. And what could he have done? He couldn't have done anything, sadly. Spend real time with people. Get to know people. When we split in our congregation, I remember I, I, I started standing in the back because I was like, I, it's partially my fault that we split because I don't know anybody's real name. I don't know anybody's story. There's so many people, there's still people today that used to went to church with us. And I was in my 20s. I don't even know their names, really, or like I know kind of a little bit about them, but I'm like, eh, I didn't really know them too much because I kind of just floated through life. Invest in people. Let's look at Hebrews 10, 25. It says, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. And Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 12 says, not giving up me Oh, same thing, sorry about that. Let me look it up here. Ecclesiastes, look, Ecclesiastes 4. Four, 9 through 12, and it says there, Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. For if either of them falls, the one will lift up his companion. But woe to the one who falls where there is not another to lift him up. Furthermore, if two lie down together, they keep warm. But how can they keep warm alone? And if one can overpower him, who is alone? Two can resist him. A cord of three strands is not quickly torn apart. We're better when we are together. There's an old Jack Johnson song. I guess it's old now. It's from the early 2000s. But he says, you're better together. And I love that song because we are. We're better together. But the devil tries to pull us apart at every instance we can. And it's little things. It's not huge things. You don't see people come in and just say, I hate God. That's, you know, that would obviously be like, well, we're not really a fan of that. They don't do that. It's the little things where we kind of irk each other. You know what? Nathan didn't shake my hand as firmly as he did before. I think he might hate me right now. You know what? He, he was talking over there, and uh, he didn't uh, come say hi to me, and little stupid things like that. You know, when he was preaching that lesson, he looked at me. I think he thinks that I've been in this. We pick out dumb things, and we try to, where does that come from? It goes from the devil again. <coughs> Have real conversations with others. One of the things in the story... In the movie Click, again, it's the same spot. He looks up, he pauses the scene where he's like with his wife and her new husband. And he looks up at the treehouse and he's like, the treehouse has not been finished. And he goes, 
Ten years? Really, I didn't have time in ten years to finish this treehouse? It's the same thing with people we care about. It's taking a moment, taking five minutes. If Chuck's telling me a story, listening to Chuck's story, not going, uh-huh, yeah, uh-huh, I, I, gotta, I gotta go. I see it all the time at work. There's a guy at work, he does the same thing. And people come in and they'll start talking to him and you can just hear him in the other room. He's just, uh-huh, mm -hmm, yeah, uh-huh, just end the conversation because he's not listening to you. Some people don't get the hint, but he's just completely turned out. Don't be that kind of person. Be in tune to the person. Listen to people. What's it say in James 1.19? It says, Dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Let's keep the same thing in mind. Do not just say, I love you, mean it. That's another way to spend time. You see people all the time say, you know, if I would just have told them I love them. I just told them I love them. A lady came in and did CPR training for us one time. She said that she was a nurse, and this guy was on, on his, you know, not doing well. And she said, uh, he said, you know, I haven't talked to my son in like five years. He had a baby out of wedlock or something like that, and, and I, I wasn't uh, very happy about it. She said, well, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. She said, why don't you give him a call? So he gave him a call. They had a conversation, and that kid said, you know what, Dad? I appreciate it so much. You have no clue how much it means to me. He said, I love you. I'll, I'll, I'll be down. I want to come down and see you. I'll bring the baby down to see you. He said, I'll be here waiting for you. He died before he got there. And that boy said, that nurse, he said, you know, that was so, he said, I'm so happy you talked him into tell, tell me that. She said, I don't know if I could live with myself. The phone works two ways. Even if someone doesn't answer your phone calls, just give them a call and tell them you love them 100,000 times. What's the worst that happens? They block you from their caller ID or whatever, who cares? Care about, caring about people too much is ne never a problem, folks. We don't say I love you, and then we have regrets about it. Let's look at 1 Peter 4 and 8. It says, above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. And 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7 says, love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Remember that one, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Another vitally important passage in our Bible that we just gloss over. Read that every day. My goodness, if we all read that every day, that would be a wonderful thing. That's what love is. One of the most emotional scenes towards the end of this thing, his controller gets broken. It goes out of haywire, so it's fast forwarding in random moments of his life. His life is going in warp speed, and he's seeing his life, himself getting older very quickly, just like in our town. Henry Winkler, if you know him, the Fonz, he plays his dad, but I love it because he's, you know, Henry Winkler's like this weird old man now, and he's kind of funny uh, and kind of nerdy, I guess. So he comes in, he always does this coin trick with his son, you know. And he comes in, he says, hey, uh, his son's grown up, he's working at his computer, his son works for him. He says, hey, the girls are playing canasta tonight, what do you say we all get together and we go do something tonight? And he's I'm looking up, he's like, uh, I got things to do, Dad, I got things to do. And he's almost pleading with him, let's just go do something. He said, you know, he comes over, to, I'll, I'll teach you the coin trick. I'll, I'll teach you the coin trick. And he looks up at him and he says, I know the coin trick. I've always known the coin trick. I know what you do. Now leave me alone. Well, the guy watching, of course, himself do that. He says, can't you even just give him some respect? And Henry Winkler's character pats him on the back, says, I love you, son. And he walks out, and that is the last time he sees his dad. And he knows that, and that guy sits there and rewinds it, and rewinds it, and rewinds it. And I tell you, it's one of the saddest things. When he looks him positive, right when his dad is looking him in the eyes, he says, I love you. How hard is it to tell someone you love them? Tell everyone you love them. Who cares? What do you have to lose? You never know when it's going to be the last time you see somebody. Realize every moment of life could be your last. What legacy did you leave behind? Look at Romans 12 and 2. 
says, do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. In Acts 8, 2, and Acts 9, 36, we see two men, we see one man and one woman, that had a good reputation. Stephen, who dies, and the brother deeply mourned for him. We see Dorcas in Acts 9. She was always doing good and helping the poor. This is their legacy through all of eternity from the Bible. We don't know much else about Dorcas other than she was good and was always helping the poor. We see a little bit about Stephen, just a microcosm of his life. But the men, the brethren, mourn deeply for him. When you die... Will anybody mourn for you? Will anybody mourn deeply for you? Thomas Campbell said a quote one time, and it always stuck with me, and it was on our fraternity wall. It said, to live in hearts we leave behind is not to die. Dorcas and Stephen, they live going forward because they did good things. When we die, we leave behind the effect we had on the world on our loved ones, neighbors, and friends. There are far more important legacies we can leave behind than money and property. The Bible states that none of us lives to himself, and no one dies to himself in Romans. Those who live following God will be missed when they die. But in Christ, even in death, they are made alive, and their words and deeds continue to influence the world. At the end of this movie, click, He's in the hospital. He's not doing well. He had a heart attack. and he, His family goes to leave. And he had this rainy scene, of course. And he's in a hospital gown. Rips himself out of the hospital bed. Runs after his family. Stops the car. And his son runs up. Hugs him. Dad, Dad, you've got to get, get, get some help. It's the daughter's there. The wife. Her new husband. And he just pours his heart out and talks about all the regrets he had. And he says, family first, family first, when he die, as he dies. And I'm telling you a little bit different, but it's God first. God first. And how many times do we see that play out, not only just in movies and TV shows, it's a wonderful <clears throat> life comes to mind, but also in life, where we see so many people at funerals, if you ever go to a funeral, if you haven't, follow, go with my mom. She goes to them way too often. And she actually crashed a funeral once, so that's a whole other story. But out of good intentions, not to just freeload. But how many times do you hear people at funerals say, I regret this, I regret that, I regret this? And how many times could the person on the other side, if we could hear them speak, say the same thing? I regret this, I regret this. What happened with the girl in our town? You know, they did a survey. A guy did a, a book named Mitch Album. He did a book called For One More Day. He said, I, I asked a bunch of people that had lost loved ones. He said, if you had one more day to live with someone that had passed away, what would you do? And he said, I was expecting extravagant things, skydiving, you know, going overseas, taking these huge trips, things like that. He said, you know what they said? Overwhelmingly. The answers came back. I would sit and talk. We'd play our favorite games. We would eat our favorite foods. But most importantly, we would talk. If you had 24 hours left to live with someone, what would you do? You wouldn't try to do the most extravagant things. You would talk. The value of conversation the value of love, the value of saying you're sorry, of humbling yourself, saying I love you. They have meaning, folks. And I'm not sure about you, but those 24 hours that I have every day, I'm going to do better at those things because God wants me to. And it's a better life than the alternative. I said a long time ago, when my parents pass away, if they pass away before me, which might not happen, I never want to regret telling them I love them. And I love you both. 
and I love all of you here. Never, ever go a day without telling people you love them. And if you're angry at somebody and you're holding hard feelings in your heart, even if you think they're petty, let them out and let them go because they are very dumb to hold on to. So what will you leave behind? How will you spend your currency, your time on earth? I'm not sure how much any of us have left, but I know the time is fleeting. And someday, somebody might watch this in the future, and I'll be long gone. And I hope that they'll listen to the same thing. The time is fleeting. What are you doing about it? And the first thing you can do is if you've never heard that Jesus is the Son of God, you do now. Romans 10, 17. So faith comes from hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ. Believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Therefore I said to you, that you will die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Repent of your sins. Say, I'm sorry. I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you all likewise perish. Confess, Peter said to them, Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Be baptized. He who has believed and is baptized shall be saved, but he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. And live faithfully unto death. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to cast you into prison, so you will be tested, and you will have tribulations for ten days. But be faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. So hopefully, all of us, like I said, this lesson was for me more than anybody, but hopefully you got something out of it. And hopefully we'll appreciate our time together more. And hopefully we'll not backbite and gossip and lie and cheat and steal time from each other. But we'll lift each other up and make each other stronger, which is what the purpose of God is. If you need to repent of your sins or you need to be baptized, please do so now as we stand and sing the songs inside.